Morning, everyone. Um, so, for those of you who weren't you here yesterday, uh, as, as it says, I'm Mark Felger. I'm a petrophysicist working at BGS. Uh, for those of you who were here yesterday, I'm afraid it's me again, so you've probably got about 30 seconds to make the exits uh, before I get going. Um, basically, what I, want to, what I want to talk to you about uh, today is um, how we looked at some of the uh, legacy data that we hold in BGS and how I was able to uh, repurpose this uh, to drive a new data set to address one of the uh, challenges around uh, energy in the UK. So uh, we heard a lot of talks yesterday about um, the use of big data, um, some of which from my colleague Emma about crowdsourcing and opening up a large amount of new information. I think we've also seen a lot of information about uh, repurposing of things like seismic studies in the oil industry. And uh, as was pointed out yesterday by a couple of talks, there's an awful lot of information that's actually put into reports by companies and individuals interpreting that um, that seems to just kind of disappear and get forgotten about. So uh, just to give you a little bit of background on uh, the British Geological Survey, uh, we're established in 1835, and some of our data actually predates us. So when we talk about variation, um, we've got some extremely varied data sets. Uh, and we collate information for the UK landmass. We, we collect very little of the information we actually use, so it gives us quite a lot of problems. And one example here is our borehole database. So this is SOBI. Um, there's over 1.36 million onshore records for wells. So, and that data dates back from 1769 to the present day. So trying to extract information from this is always very tricky. Um, and what I really want to take you, you to take away is that no two boreholes are actually the same. So if I was going to talk, uh, ask you to picture what you think a borehole operation might look like, you might think of something like that, your classical sort of nodding dog hydrocarbon. You might possibly think of something a bit like this, uh, this was some work uh, funded by ERA. You probably don't necessarily think of something of this scale. And actually, onshore in the UK, this is the kind of scale of operation that is most common. This is actually a, uh, a water well, and it's being logged by uh, the BGS logging truck. So in terms of the amount of data that's available for uh, different wells, you have to look at the purpose. And that's mostly why I work with onshore hydrocarbon data. It's quite limited in terms of where it's collected because you would only collect it where there's potentially a resource. Usually it's coal fields, so you can see clustered quite nicely around um, some of the areas and obviously in the weald as well. It's pretty variable, as, uh, as I've said, and I'll show you in a second. Um, but it's one of the key tools for studying the deep subsurface onshore in the UK because we're, in terms of the data that's collected, uh, there's much better variety and much more information. So to talk to you about uh, some of the information that we hold for these wells, digitally we've got about uh, a 1,000 records for onshore hydrocarbon wells, and they consist of a few different types of information. So the first are paper records that were sent to us over a long period of time and we've scanned. Uh, so I've got an example of a log plot here, but uh, we also have quite a lot of reports. List tapes um, were quite common, so industry-specific formats, basically D list and list. So this is what we used to get, where someone would send us a tape, possibly with a sticker on it, that told us where it was from and what it was for. Possibly not. Uh, you can use the Slumberjay toolbox to extract the headers off these files. So sometimes you get a nice file where this is uh, one of ours, um, where you uh, have some metadata about the area, what was collected, um, and then obviously that means you can use it moving forward. Sometimes you get absolutely nothing and the tape just starts and you've got a large amount of information that someone's paid a lot of money to collect that is essentially not really useful anymore because we don't know where, it, where it's collected or why. And then we also get a lot of information in sort of proprietary formats, things like PDFs, JPEGs, TIFFs, that kind of thing. So I just wanted to give you a few examples of some of the kind of variation that we see. Um, there's a nice little thing here. So this was uh, drilling suspended for two weeks in 1949 for an annual holiday, which is uh, quite nice. I'm not sure if that would, uh, that would happen anymore. <laughs> we get some handwritten records, which are extremely difficult to work with and pretty much illegible. Um, it's probably worth saying it's a little bit hypocritical coming from me because my handwriting's not the best, but um, it's quite hard to, uh, to extract any kind of information from, uh, from this data set. Now, you'd think if someone typed a report up, you'd get a better quality, but not necessarily the case. Um, some of the information that we've got is very, very hard to work through, and any kind of uh, 
mining methods on these kind of reports are, are quite tricky. And then occasionally we get some very strange things that are contained in our reports. So there's a nice article here about a local councillor's cruise, um, just in one of the middle of the reports I was looking through. And a particularly charming headline from the uh, Manchester Guardian, all in the East Midland, all in the Midland starts to flow with no gush. So, in terms of trying to identify data to work with, um, as I say, we've got a huge amount of uh, information that are contained in these well reports. Um, now these can be anything from five pages long to 300 pages long and can contain any information from things like planning, costing, geological information, core analysis, um, pretty much the whole lot. But in terms of how they were being stored on uh, our systems in every single folder, they were essentially named sequentially um, based on when they were scanned in. So there's no information contained about what it was collected for and whether it's got any value. Uh, mining the reports requires some specialist software or if you've got a lot of time and patience you can use Acrobat Pro. Um, basically I'd sort of, I'd look at a report, I'd convert it to PDF, I'd go and make a cup of tea, I'd come back, I'd OCR it and go and make another cup of tea. <laughs> so, and actually when I went through the, uh, the data set I realised that there were over four and a half thousand uh, reports that were contained from the hydrocarbon industry sat on our servers with basically no one able to access them. So we looked to convert them, and um, basically I did this with one of my colleagues, Tony Myers, and it was the two of us, and it took us probably in total, in terms of staff time, maybe a couple of days. Um, so to automate the process, uh, we first of all um, <coughs> took all the PDFs. Oh, that's got mixed around. Oh, well. Basically, we took all the PDF. We identified all the TIFFs initially. Uh, using a, uh, a simple text search, and then converted them onto a temporary file space that mimicked the exact file structure they were already kept in. So we copied them across uh, and converted them to PDF. What we did then was we added a unique character to the end of every single report, which actually was linked to where it was stored in our corporate data structure. So we kept that, that audit trail of where the information came from, as well as making every single report unique. Now, the reason that we did this is because to batch process optical character recognition in Acrobat, everything has to be copied to the same file space. So you can imagine if I've got uh, a 1,000 reports all named rep underscore 001.tiff, if we didn't add that unique character, you wouldn't be able to bring the information back. And then simply uh, we copied the uh, PDFs that then had been batch processed in Acrobat back onto our data store with a bat file, and we won't bench this all in FME. So this was the initial job, um, and it's pretty simple actually to put together. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was that really. So in terms of uh, the challenges that we can address with the data, and I'm gonna talk about shale gas again, because I'm afraid if you work onshore in the UK, um, shale gas is the topic that everyone's talking about right now. And uh, carboniferous bowl and shale in particular has been a target of uh, interest. And it's because it's quite similar to some of the large producing units in the US, so your Barnets, your Eaglefords. But in the UK, there's actually very little information about the shells. In terms of work that has been done previously, uh, BGS did some work back in 2013 to uh, characterize the reserve estimates for the bowl and shell, and it came up with about 264 trillion cubic feet. And to put that in a kind of context for you, uh, in 2016, the uh, consumption in the UK was around about the three trillion cubic feet mark. So you've potentially got a huge reserve. But it does underlie a lot of major cities. And in fact, if you look at the 2011 census, it could be as many as 14.6 million people that live in areas that are underlain by the bowl and shale. So th there's obviously a lot of interest around the process. And then you add to that that back in 2011 at the uh, Priest Hall site, uh, some of the testing operations there were linked to a couple of minor earthquakes and that affected public confidence in the technique quite badly. That also came at the same time that we were seeing some of the uh, headlines coming out of the US about potential practice, and actually all the applications for shale gas remain pretty controversial to this day. <coughs> so uh, after the incident at Priest Hall, the Royal Society, Royal Academy of Engineering, undertook a, uh, a study to uh, compile a lot of data about UK shells and address any potential knowledge gaps. And they came out with this recommendation that BGS or other appropriate bodies should carry out national surveys to characterise stresses. And actually, in situ stress is where I do a lot of my work these days. 
So in terms of why that might be important, and I'm, I think a number of you will probably already know this, but uh, the stress fields is a major constraint on a lot of subsurface development, um, and that's everything from the shallow um, engineering sector, things like um, tunneling or mining, and potentially in uh, subsurface storage, be that gas, radioactive waste. And uh, under, uh, understanding stress, though, can allow you to predict not only the orientation, but the plane in which a hydraulic fracture will propagate at first order. Um, I'm talking about it in terms of shale gas, but actually hydraulic fracturing is quite important for uh, some geothermal resource development as well. And just to very quickly uh, give you an idea, at depth in the earth, all rocks are uh, under stress, and you can, uh, you can basically simplify that with a vertical borehole to three principal components. So that's one vertical stress that acts straight down, and then two horizontal stresses that act at right angles to each other. So, actually, in terms of what was available for the UK landmass, even uh, a couple of years ago, back in 2016, uh, the only open source data set, which is the World Stress Map, had stress magnitude information for only 25 sites across the entire of the UK. <coughs> so, it's not really sufficient for trying to plan your operations. So, basically, what we wanted to see if we could do is use these new reports to try and work out if we could identify stress field information, which we could then characterize in regions and feed it back into the, uh, into the public domain. And to do that, I used a, lot, a few manual searches, really. Simply, I was looking for formation integrity tests and leak-off tests in the first instance, see if I could find that and, uh, and extract that information. So it has allowed me to much better characterize the stress fields. And uh, basically, I, I picked two areas. Um, where I knew that there was applications ongoing for potential uh, shale gas uh, exploration. And um, these also, the two areas here, have some of the highest density of hydrocarbon wells uh, in the region. Now, if you're looking at that and saying that doesn't actually look all that dense, well, there you've got one of the problems that we're often dealing with. So uh, what I did, I identified, um, I basically did a spatial clip to identify all of the hydrocarbon wells in the area, and then one by one, I went through those reports and mined them uh, myself. It wasn't a particularly quick process, but it didn't take all that long uh, either. And using that information, I was actually able to not only characterize the vertical stress from pulling some of the, uh, some of the Y-line logs that I had for those wells and uh, analyzing them, but actually, I was also able to put regional estimates on minimum horizontal stress here, as well as uh, some ver the vertical stress here and the pore pressure here because I extracted some RFT data from, uh, from the logs which I was able to use. And uh, this has actually tripled the number of sites which we've got shell gas, uh, we've got stress field information for across the UK. So uh, hopefully that will show you that um, basically by using optical character recognition you can potentially open up a lot of new information. Um, without a lot of staff resources, uh, this, as I say, only took a few days for myself and my colleague and we've been able to use this to characterize the system. But, you know, what I've done is a pretty simplistic first pass clip of some information. It's, uh, it's helped in terms of that, but uh, I'd be interested if other people have got different ideas as to what we could do with that and what we potentially mine from that. Um, and we could potentially now look at some automatic processing methods that were discussed yesterday. Thank you. I'll come back. I, I have a question. Yep. And that's, what, what do you think is the next step? So I think potentially we could look at um, looking in other areas. So we've got information in the wheeled. So that, that's potentially that's one place we could look to, <coughs> to go. But it, it depends really what, what the call for information is. We, we kind of I have some research interests, and then we have some stuff that we are required to do as an organization. So sometimes, if you, I, I can't just sort of sit around just looking around for my own, uh, uh, my my own interest really. So uh, I was quite interested with some of the talks yesterday about potentially con looking to create uh, methodologies and then uh, potentially doing large scale mining. But it's, as you can see, in terms of the variety of data and the quality, it's uh, it's quite difficult to use a totally automated method. We'd need to do quite a lot of refining to get to get to that process. I think. <coughs> 